Let me get started. Um, my name is Hans Verkau. I work for Cisco Systems Norway on video conferencing equipment and I am one of the sub-maintainers for the media subsystem of the kernel. I do a lot of HDMI receiver and transmitter work and part of the HDMI standard is an optional extension called CEC, Consumer Electronics Control. Starting with kernel 4.8, there is a new framework to do handle that. And this presentation is about what is it, why do you want it, and how is it implemented. But that's all very boring. Um, let's go to uh, outer space, final frontier, the Pluto probe New Horizons. As of yesterday, it is just a tad over 5.5 billion kilometers from Berlin. And it is still uploading to planet Earth all the information and pictures it took uh, from Pluto. And it's doing that at a bit rate of about 1 to 2 kilobit per second. Which is, at that distance, an enormous feat. That's, that's real engineering. So anything I'm telling after this, that's, that's nothing compared to that. Especially if you look at CEC, which at one meter distance does 400 <laughs> bits per second. So this is really relaxed engineering. You can have all the time in the world. This is, and, and at the same, I mean, this is for HDMI, so if one, a few pins uh, further on, you get data whizzing around at 600 megahertz. So this is old style. So what is it? Uh, consumer electronics control, and it was, it's basically a pin on the HDMI connector, and devices may or may not support it. It's optional. And it allows various HDMI consumer electronics like DVD players, TVs, audio, AV receivers to, to communicate with one another. <laughs> so that when you put in a DVD, in your DVD player, the TV goes on automatically and the, the AV receiver goes on and everything is set up correctly. Um, it is based on the old AV Lynx card standard. You may remember those really big, ugly connectors. And it basically comes from the time when you, know, you had your video recorder and your TV and you wanted to do the same thing. You put in your tape and automatically the TV goes on. Um, as far as I can tell, the physical protocol, electrical protocol is pretty much the same. The higher level protocol seems to be quite different. <laughs> you basically have a one byte header and then up to 15 bytes of payload. Uh, remember, this is 400 bits per second, so that's about 36 bytes per second, so you really don't have a lot of uh, bandwidth available. This can be implemented in HDMI receivers, HDMI transmitters, and you also have, um, where do I have it? Yes, USB dongles like this. This connects to your PC, you have the, let me get the right, well, the PC goes in on this side, the TV goes in on this side, and you can control the CEC through USB on your PC. This is used a lot when people want to hook up their uh, streaming PC uh, setup box with a TV, and the graphics card doesn't support CEC. That's where it's typically used. These things are about $35 or Euro, something in that order, so they're quite cheap and they're quite popular. The way it works, so every CEC device, they have a physical address, and the physical address is a two-byte number with four nibbles, and each nibble is basically a topology uh, identifier. At the top level, you have the TV, that's always zero, 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 zero. Uh, if a TV has multiple inputs, they will be one, zero, 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 two, zero, zero, three, zero, zero, etc. And then one level below that, you get 1.2.00, etc. So you have a limited number of devices, of course, because of this. Uh, invalid, that typically means there is no CEC, then it's FF, FF. If you connect your PC, for example, to a TV, then you will read out the EDID, and the EDID will give you the physical address that is assigned to you. So that's where you get that information. You don't make that up yourself, except if you're a TV, because then it's hard-coded. You also have a logical address. The logical address is used whenever you send a message, because you have an initiator, or the source, and you have a destination, where do you send it to? 
And each CEC device has its own logical address, which means that in practice you can't have more than 15 CEC devices. Well, you can have more, but that's getting complicated. You have very limited functionality in that case. It's not an address as you know it for as an IP address. It's really more a nickname where the, the number actually identifies what type of device you are. And it, I mean, this is an excellent example of um, a committee product. You know, they started out with one TV, oh, fair enough, and then, oh, we just need two recording devices, one tuner, a playback device, and an audio system, and then, yeah, I have more tuners, so let's add a few more. And someone came up with, oh, I have a playback device. And at some point, around ID 12, they just gave up and said, well, I have two, two reserved fields, let's, let's call them backup, you can use it for anything. Uh, this, this sort of illustrates already the fact that it is a, a protocol that is fuzzy, that evolved, that is a committee product that's not properly designed. And that's also one of the big issues that we have with CEC, it's, it's a mess. So topology example, you have the TV, that's always a fixed one, that's always zero. And then you can have uh, DVD players connected, you can have recording devices, audio video receivers, uh, HDMI switches. Well, this, this is of course an extreme example. What you typically have in practice, you have your TV, you have an audio video receiver for your home cinema system, and then a DVD Blu-ray player, a set of box perhaps connected, and that's about it. That's what most people have. Um, God knows why, but this is the only one actually calling this CEC is Hitachi. Everybody else makes up their own name. I don't know why. Uh, it's complete mystery to me. But if you see any net on your Samsung TV, that's really CEC. I, yeah, what can I say? Why would you want to implement it? Well, it has a number of nice features. One of them is that you know it's a bi-directional way of communicating with discovering and communicating with other devices. Um, if you had fancy ideas about using it to upload the firmware, forget it. 400 bits per second, remember that. You, I mean, it's faster to update the firmware on the new Horizons probe than it is to do that for your TV using CEC. So, uh, it is very limited. All these packets, they tend to be very small. And it, it is more or less the minimum that you need in order to get these equipment work together and, and use it in what, what, the, what the customer expects. So you, as I said, you turn on your DVD player, you want to automatically turn on the rest of the system and reverse to go into standby. So most of these features and all these these messages, they're grouped into features for different product types and one product can implement multiple features, whatever is relevant for them. So you have the one touch play, which is start playing automatically, go into standby, uh, start recording, timer programming, uh, play fast forward control, controlling tuners, the menu, Remote control pass-through, that's one of the most commonly used. You know, you have one single remote and you send it, say, your TV. And the TV will pass on the volume up control to the AV receiver. And that's then the one that handles it. Um, system audio control, that's for AV receivers. I I'm not going through everything. Uh, device power status, that's a fairly important one. That is, is it on and off, basically? Um, routing is relevant for HDMI switches, so you can choose the right ports, so the, the right product is, is connected to the right, the right input is connected to the right output. System information is more generic stuff. Um, dynamic audio lip sync is very useful to get audio latencies from the device. Um, I actually don't know why that isn't used more often. Uh, it's fairly rare. But anyone who ever hooked up a TV to your audio video system, they often have to set up the audio latency in the AV receiver. Because it takes time to process, if there's some extra processing going on for the video in the TV, the audio can be delayed if the audio goes straight to the AV receiver. 
And this feature was added so you can just query the TV, give me the audio latency or video latency. Uh, it's actually quite rare. I, I have yet to see TVs implementing this. I don't know why, because it's an enormously useful feature. Uh, you have vendor specific commands. This is the Achilles heel of CEC. Problem is, most vendors, they make their own vendor commands, so they work with their own products. But if you use a Sony player with a Samsung TV, it may not quite work as well as if you use both Samsung products. It, it completely defeats the whole purpose of CEC, which is interoperability. But uh, things are getting better because CEC is getting more popular. Most mid and high-end products, they will all have it these days. At low end, maybe, maybe not, you have to check. Which is not that easy because, as I said, they never use CEC, they call it something else, so you have to know that. The Wikipedia page for CEC, they actually have a whole list of all these weird brand names, so you can check there. Uh, audio return channel, that is getting fairly popular. So normally you give video and audio to the device, but now you can get audio back as well. And that is controlled through CEC, the, the capability handling. You can also do Ethernet. I will come back to that here a bit more. So nobody uses Ethernet. It is available in CEC. So basically CEC is the configuration protocol. And then for Ethernet over HDMI, they're using two pins to, to transport that. The protocol is horrible. Nobody's using it because everyone either has wired Ethernet or just a Wi-Fi chip. So I, I have yet to see a TV implementing this. I know of one AV receiver that is hideously expensive that has it, but if there's no TV to connect it to, I'm not sure what the point is. Uh, what makes it even worse is when you use Ethernet, you use two pins to transport Ethernet, which is the utility pin, which is typically unused, and the hot plug detect. Now anyone who knows hot plug detect, the, if you use that one, you can't uh, signal, for example, that an EDID has changed because you would have to pull the hot plug down, but then you lose Ethernet. So what they did is they added a CEC message to tell you whether hot plug goes up or down. It's a nightmare, and almost nobody uses it. <coughs> Audio return channel is fairly common, and it's getting very popular. And that one, actually you have two modes for audio return channel. One uses one pin, and I think pretty much everybody does that. And the other mode uses two pins, and then you run into the same problem with the hot plug detect, which, which is probably the reason why nobody uses that in practice. So the problems that you typically get when you work with CEC, uh, first of all, it's optional, so you don't know if the other side implements it. But that is getting better and better. Most devices, electronics devices, they do have it these days. There are several versions of CEC. 1.3 is still in use, 1.4 is the most common one. Very little difference between 1.3 and 1.4. 2.0, it's a much better standard because they tightened up a lot of the specs. So things that were fuzzy are now, well, let's say less fuzzy. But it is rarely used. I don't know why. It's really a lot better than the 1.4 that respect. Uh, it's, a, it's a protocol that evolves, people added stuff whenever they needed it, and then it got standardized, and it... Uh, awfully slow. I, I, I have no idea when they, when they added it to the HDMI standards, couldn't they have just clocked it up a bit? It would have been much more useful that they just kept the old AV, AV link standards for that. And the protocol has lots of... Uh, <coughs> Lots of custom requirements and custom limitations, things you can do only so often. It, it, they're mostly related to the fact that it is so slow. So you want to avoid unnecessary packets. So if someone, if you try to send something to a device and the device says, well, I, I don't support this, uh, this message, then you're not supposed to send it again. So there are lots of special cases and, and, and it makes it a very difficult protocol to implement in software, to, to, to make the protocol stack. Um, one reason for writing a kernel framework for this was that it allows you to have a single place where you can put not all, but most of these constraints. 
So how is it implemented? Actually, I started on this about four years ago. So and now within Cisco for video conferencing, our products at that time, they did use CEC, but very limited. Just basically being able to put a monitor or TV into standby and power it up again. So we, we had our own, like everybody else today, we had our own very simple CEC implementation. And well, I was kernel developer, so that's not a good thing, of course. So I decided to make a sort of a framework and I got about, at the time I thought I was 90% ready. And then all the things happened and it basically was put in the fridge and it's lay dormant for two, two and a half years. Then Samsung picked it up. They wanted to use it for Exynos 4 and Camille Debsky developed it further, but then he left Samsung, so it was dormant again. But then we realized that we wanted to do a lot more with CEC, so it was a good opportunity to take it back and I started to develop it further with the goal of finally getting this into the kernel. And with 4.8, it is in the kernel, in staging. Uh, I'll talk about a little bit more about that later, what is still to be done to get it out of staging. Um, so one of the things that basically is a list of requirements that I had, because it's so slow, it is also highly asynchronous, so you send a message and the reply can come back much later with lots of other messages in between. Uh, you don't want to have blocking waits, you don't want to wait for a second, it's not a good idea. Uh, not in the kernel at least. Um, you need to take care of those replies that are out of order, so you want to be able to, to handle that gracefully in the framework. Where messages are handled, so things like, for example, a message that uh, changes the hot plug detect state, that is something that needs to be handled in the kernel. Other things need to be in user space. Other things may depend on what you're building. So you need to have the ability to put things both in the kernel and into user space. You need to send and parse messages both in the kernel and user space, so having a single header to do to that is accessible by both would be very useful. Uh, you need to support receivers, transmitters, and these USB dongles, so you have to take care of these different subsystems. And quite important is one, you really want to handle disconnect and connect scenarios gracefully. So if you disconnect, you lose, of course, your physical address. If you reconnect, you need to read the EDID and, and the, the, the physical address may have changed. You also lost your logical address after the disconnect and you need to reclaim it. And it may be different after the reconnect. If another device was connected in the meantime, they may have claimed it, so you need to have a, get another one. It's really not something you want to do in user space. It's getting messy. You want the framework to do that for you, so you don't have to think about it. Um, well, the device note was easy, the name, CEC. The driver developer can determine what level of control user space has. So you, if you want to do everything in kernel space, not recommended, but say you, you might want to do that, then you can actually block user space from tr actually transmitting messages. You want to keep everything inside. Uh, I will talk more about, this is, this is an extreme case. We don't have anything like that. But you can also say, um, I want to create a remote control commands, go to a remote control device as well. There are a number of things that you can select, what is allowed and what isn't. If you need to implement a driver, you just need to implement a number of low-level adapter operations. Uh, practical experience is until now that a new device takes about two days of work. They're really simple. There are some exceptions. OMAP 4 was a lot more work, but there, but there were lots of bugs elsewhere in the, in the subsystem that took a long while for me to figure out. Uh, in general, it's not very, very much work. Uh, and the framework deals with all the details of the protocol, asynchronous stuff, and it, it shields you from all that complexity. Uh, a lot of the core CEC messages are handled automatically by the framework. So someone gives you a new physical address, some, say some device comes up and it sends its physical address around, it will be automatically registered and things like that. There's support for monitoring CEC messages, which is absolutely brilliant for debugging. Um, it depends on the hardware support. So 
it will always monitor messages that you transmit or that you receive. Uh, there is also the opportunity in hardware to monitor messages going from one device to another device, but not to you. And if the hardware supports it, you can monitor that as well. Uh, the very nice thing, this dongle can be put in that mode. So you can put it in the middle of some setup and then use your PC to monitor what is going on over the CEC bus. Very useful for debugging. And it was staged in 4.8. Uh, was merged in staging in 4.8. So the framework itself, you have one header, and the header contains a huge amount of static inline functions that can parse and uh, create CEC messages. That is shared between kernel space and user space, and that does everything for you. So. Basically, the, the structure, this is the main uh, message structure. You have some timestamps, length of the payloads. You can set up a timeout, because if you, you want to wait how long it takes, how long you wait for a reply, for example. Sequence counter, some flags, this is the message itself. Um, I will come back to this one later, and then a whole bunch of status and, and counters that help you with, with uh, uh, whether the message succeeded or not. Typical way to do this, you have this structure, you create a structure, you initialize it. This is the initiator, so who is sending it. This is where you go, who you send it to. And then you use this inline message to just fill in the whole payload. And a typical static inline looks like this. It just fills in the message structure, sets up the length, uh, it takes care of some boundary checking if that is necessary. And you have the reverse that takes a message and extracts the information from it. This is a really practical example. This is, uh, this is the message to get the CEC version. So it sets the length to two. This is the command. And then the reply, this is a Boolean, whether or not you want to wait for a reply. So one thing which you very often do is you send a message and you want to wait for the reply. If you set reply to true, then the reply field is filled in with the message that you expect back. And the framework will actually wait around until the timeout. By default, that's one second, because that's what the spec says. You need to get a reply within one second. Not that it's always a one second in practice, but that's another matter. And then the framework will just, you do the transmit, and the framework will, will wait until the reply comes back, or until the message is uh, aborted, so that the device can say, I don't know this message, which would be really bad, because this is a, everyone, everyone needs to support this, or until the timeout is reached. And then, you, then the, your transmit ends, and you have the status information, and you can see what you get back. This is very useful because you don't need to do all the asynchronous and out of order handling. It will all be done by the framework. So you send this message and then the other side will then fill in the version, the right version. Uh, we'll send it back and you receive a CEC version command and you parse the version out of it. And then you know what the version is for that remote CEC device. Um, when you write a new CC adapter, it is basically this, this is all you need. So you make a number of operations. You need to have an adapter enable to actually enable the, the hardware. This one is optional. Um, some devices have a special mode to enable monitor all, which means, as I said before, you, you can monitor messages between two different CC from CC devices. That's not you yourself. They often come with warnings, only use this for debugging, do, don't use this normally. So if that's the case, then you need to, then this operation, you need to fill in this operation to actually explicitly enable this mode. I don't, I, they never tell you, they say that it's only for debugging, but they don't tell you what would go wrong if you always enable it. So better safe than sorry, so I made it a separate operation. Logical address, so when you have claimed a new logical address, you need to fill it in in the hardware. 
The transmit speaks for itself, transmits a message. This is optional, or there is a, in debugfs, there is a status file that gives the current status of the adapter. And if you have low-level information you want to add, then this operation will be called. And this is a high-level callback, so when a message is received, your adapter can be called and you can process that message if you want. And you can say, okay, after processing it, you can either allow it to continue to use the space, or you can say, no, I've processed it, don't pass it on. And finally, there are two functions that you typically call from the interrupts routine. So when you, when you transmit a message, you fill in the hardware and you say, transmit it. When it's done, you get an interrupt, and you have to call transmit done with status information, did it succeed, what sort of error conditions are there. And the same when you receive a message, you just fill in strict message and you pass it on to the framework. And that's all there is, and this is typically, as I said, about two days work for reasonably sane hardware. The public API, again, is fairly simple. There is a capability, get capabilities. Uh, so what can you do with the adapter? Really, the most important one is CUP physical address. Um, as I mentioned before, ideally, when you hook it up, the driver will automatically find the EDID and the physical address and set it automatically. There are cases where you cannot do this, most notably a dongle like this, because you don't get EDID information, so it has to come from outside. Drivers that need that set this capability, and then that means that the user space has to find the right EDID and physical address and set it up. Um, get set physical address speaks for itself. Uh, this is the main power function, really. That's, uh, you call that, and you, that, that's what defines what sort of device you want to be. Do you want to be a tuner, a TV, a playback device? Um, which CEC version are you going to support, 2.0 or 1.4? The default is 2.0. I see no point in, by default, supporting an old version. Uh, you can put in some vendor ID, OSD name, a whole bunch of information that is fixed. So you set it, and it's all fixed, it's stored. And whenever you disconnect, then the CEC adapter will <coughs> automatically be disabled, and you reconnect, and it finds a physical address, and it will automatically reclaim logical addresses and set it up automatically again to the right uh, device type. So you typically set this up once and you don't touch it again. Then you have get set mode. Um, so what happens in user space? How, how do you typically implement this? You need to, you, there are two parts. One of is that you Control, try to control a remote device. The other is that you have to reply to messages that you receive. So there in the CEC terminology, that's an initiator. You do something actively. The other is a follower, where you just receive messages and you need to reply to them and take action. Um, so if you implement it in an application, you want to, depending on your specific use case, you may want to get exclusive access that you're the only one who can initiate messages, or the only one who can handle received messages, or do you want to allow others to do it as well? So you have the mode where you can actually say, well, I'm, by default, you're just initiator. You don't have exclusive access. But you can make yourself an exclusive initiator, and then you're the only one who can send messages. And the same for follower. You can be a regular follower, then you will receive messages or you can be exclusive, then nobody else can receive messages. And then you have a special pass-through mode. As I mentioned, by default, the core will handle, or the framework will handle some core messages automatically. There are cases where you want to do that yourself, and then you put it in pass-through mode, and then except for a few documented uh, messages where you always have to handle it in the core, they will just be passed on to you without any further processing. And you can also use it to put it to put yourself into monitor mode. Receive and transmit speaks for itself. Uh, DQ events that allows you to uh, respond to 
well, basically it's disconnect and reconnect events. So you disconnect and then you get informed, okay, hey, everything is gone. You reconnect and you get being, you're informed of your new physical and logical addresses and you can start everything up again. There are a number of utilities. Um, this is actually, uh, I mean, CEC is, is a complex protocol. So you want, just making a framework is not enough. You really want to provide also a whole bunch of utilities that allow you to test things and have sort of a reference implementation. So we have three utilities and one test driver. CEC, C2, anyone who knows the media subsystem, I've written a whole bunch of utilities for video for Linux and basically I modeled this after what I've done there. So you have a Swiss Army knife, CEC, CTL. You can send all messages, all the messages defined in the protocol you can send it with and you use it to configure the adapter to whatever, whether it's a TV or a playback or etc. And then there are two utilities that you can use for compliance testing. Um, kudos to my summer intern, Johan Fjeldvet, who did this work. So he, one of the things that we really wanted, because this, the specification is so fuzzy, so the implementations are even fuzzier, uh, certainly ambiguous and non-standard. The weird thing, the, the, the HDMI <laughs> standard actually has compliance tests. Uh, one of the most, one of the first tests that they do is when you send a message that is not supported, you need to get a feature board back. Well, pretty much all the implementations that I've tested, they don't do it, they just time out. Which means that if you want to discover whether someone supports something, you just send it and then you twiddle your thumbs for a second, then it times out and then, well, it's probably not supported. When it should have <coughs> responded with a feature board. So I think nobody runs those tests. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't understand it. Anyway, the compliance test can be used to test a remote device, or of course, the other way around, your own implementation. Um, it goes through all the features, it tries to see what is supported and what isn't. We do have coverage for all the features, but some of the features are very limited. Uh, we never use tuners, so we just check is there some tuner feature support. We don't do any in-depth compliance tests. Patches are welcome. Things where we, for our products, are really interested in, that is done much better, and we have a fairly complete test sequence there. But if you want to test, you also need a follower. So you need, your own device need to reply to receive messages as if it was a playback device or a TV or whatever you try to emulate. So we made a reference implementation for a follower. So if you want to test something, you, you run your follower on your own system, and then you run CEC compliance to the remote system. And that, that way you can test how well that remote device is actually working, how well the implementation is. It's by no means complete, but at least it, it gives you a certain level of confidence that you otherwise would not have, or you would have to buy very expensive equipment to try and test this. Uh, finally, Vivid. Um, this is an existing driver, Virtual Video. We use it for Video for Linux to test, for example, uh, an HDMI receiver without actually requiring you to have hardware for an HDMI receiver. It emulates it. So I add a support for CEC as well. So it emulates CEC adapter, including how slow it is. So it is still 400 bits per second, even though it's emulated. And you can use this to, to test your own application and uh, it is very useful for testing your program without actually having the, the hardware. As I said, this framework is in staging. It is pretty complete. There are a few things, a few corner cases that I need to double check before it can go out of staging. I have patches for most of them. I just need some, say, two days of time to finish it. Uh, probably the most um, thing that will take me the most time 
is to take a second look at error handling because the specification is fuzzy with respect to error handling. Actual implementations, hardware implementations are way fuzzier. Uh, there are some that just say error. There are some that actually give some more feedback what type of error it is. There are, there are some they, they say foo without explaining what foo actually means. So um, I, I would like to have a second look at this part so that might change a little bit. Otherwise it will be unchanged, pretty much unchanged, just some corner cases to clean up. Other things to do, I have an OMAP4 implementation for the PANA board, but needs to be cleaned up. Um, audio return channel, CDC, there may be some more kernel support necessary there, I, I'm not sure yet. Integrate with the media controller, so you can associate the video node with the corresponding CDC node, that would be handy. And put more um, intelligence into the framework to handle all, sort all sorts of weird constraints that the standard has. I want to, so here are some resources. Uh, all the utilities, they're completely up to date, up to kernel 4.8, they're here. User space documentation is in the, the document, doc book, uh, well, no, no longer doc book, but now Sphinx documentation in the kernel. Um, the kernel API documentation, for some reason, it doesn't turn up here, so I made my own copy. It's a book somewhere and my email, but let me get a quick so I have loaded the Vivid driver you can see it here and there are two CC nodes, one is for the capture device HDMI capture, one is for, an, say, that would be equivalent to a TV. The other is an output device, equivalent to a, say, DVD player. And they're inside the driver, they are connected together. So, if you just run CCCTL, it gives the information. It gives just some driver information, what, what is happening. Um, Oh, it's already, uh, okay, wait a moment. Let's make a clean slate. So. So by default, you can see there are uh, logical addresses that are assigned zero. Uh, physical address is zero, zero, zero. So as I said, it's a capture device, so it's a TV that's hard coded. Physical address for the outputs is 1000, basically the first input port for the TV. And again, zero logical addresses, so nothing is, nobody told the CC adapter what it is. Um, minus D1, by the way, so you can also write minus D slash dev slash CC1, but I'm lazy and I like to just provide the, the number of the device, which is much easier to do. So let's set it up. So the first CC device, let's make it a TV. Now it suddenly has a logical address. This is all filled in. It says OSD name is TV, sort of the default that I gave it. Uh, it fills in various CC types, primary devices, TV, logical address type is of the type TV, well, a whole bunch of stuff. And the same you do for the playback device. Again, you have one logical address that is claimed, and this is all set up as a playback device. Um, so one thing I want to do is to demonstrate Vivid together with CEC compliance. So the help text for CEC compliance is basically, you, again, the device, the remote device that you want to test. Uh, this is test adapter, does more internal tests that actually tests your own adapter. So it tries all the IOCTLs, see if nothing is broken. And these are all the external tests. You also have an interactive mode. A lot of these tests require, say, power down the TV. Unfortunately, you don't get 
good status information back. Yes, there is a power status command, but frankly, implementations suck. So you, uh, you have things like, okay, power down a device, and then it asks, did it power down? You know, things like that. Uh, the default is that it tries to do everything automatically, but you're missing out from some of the tests that you can only do in interactive mode. These are basically all the features. Uh, by default, it tries them all. Um, but that can be annoying if you just want to test one specific part. In that case, you can select what you want. Oh, for the, before I forget. So CTL, CTL, uh, CEC, CTL. That has a fairly long list of options. So the, the top ones, they just, so this allows you to send any message. So the top ones, they do all sort of global stuff, including, you know, where do you want to send the message to and who is it from. Show topology is very useful. I will show that soon. Uh, because it shows, I can actually, I will do that in a minute. It shows you what devices are connected. It, de it detects the bus. Here are where you set up what for, what type of device you have. And then at the end, you have, for each feature, you have an additional help text. Which I can also do through help all. Uh, oh, without the manage aids. And then you get the help for all the messages that you can send. So there are a lot of them. Um, this is auto-generated from a header. I wasn't crazy. It's a very ugly Perl script that, that creates all this stuff. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. So if I now run CEC compliance, you will see here, so it gets network topology, that's all great, but it, it fills here for some, some of the options. Power status, I don't get a proper power status. Uh, it says that's here again, and, and what is missing is that there is no follower. So you send messages to a device, but nobody is processing. Yeah, the core messages are processed, but anything outside of that, there is nobody running. So, if I run the CEC follower explicitly, and then try this again, then suddenly things work again. So now I get a proper power status because the follower running there that is actually receiving the messages, giving the right reply, and you get what you, uh, what you expect to see. Oh yeah, I wanted to show, show topology. This is very useful. Um, it just detects all other devices. So you are the TV and it's looking for other devices, it finds a playback device. It also shows the topology in a more graph-like structure. There are only two devices here, so it's fairly simple. And if I just run the full compliance test check, then you get an idea of what it's all doing. So it's, it's a fairly extensive test suite. And if you run this for a remote device, you get sort of a really decent idea of the level of crap. I would like to say that it's all perfect. Well, it's nowhere near. But at least you have some idea of how bad it is. That's it for me. Questions? So, um, I actually have two questions, mostly related to the staging part. Um, did you merge it in staging because you're not quite sure about the Microsoft API or for some other reason? Um, Yes. Can you repeat so the, the question, please? Yeah. So did I put it in <coughs> staging because I was not sure about the user space API or were there other reasons? Uh, it was partially the user space API. So, uh, you know, it's chicken and egg. As long as it's not in the kernel, nobody is using it. Also, at that time, the compliance test was still being developed. Uh, now I'm, I'm happy with the user space API. Okay. 
because we, we have done the whole compliance test and it's all working out fine. Uh, I also knew there were some corner cases that were not handled correctly yet, for which I had to think about a little bit, but they were really, you know, tiny things. Um, I think the user space API uh, as is stands. The only place where I might make changes is in error handling, error status, because that is, I need to do another read up on the specs and the compliance tests and double check whether I do the right thing. So that's, that's, just, that's just some status bits, some minor changes. And the second question derives from this one. Um, let's say I have an HMI transmitter on DRM and I want to enable CC support um, using the CC framework. Uh, is it allowed for non-staging code to like, look into staging framework? So is it, if you want to add support for this, is it allowed for non-staging code to hook into staging? Um, it's a, if it's a new driver that's fairly independent, you would put it in staging. There are a few now in staging. Uh, I also have one case, the ADV 7604 and some, some analog devices, receivers and transmitters, where uh, that code is under an if def, uh, no, uh, let me see, it's, it's under an kconfig option that is only enabled if you have staging as well. So I, I'm taking special care. My, I, my hope is that it will go out of staging by 4.10 or 4.11 at the latest. I just need two full days to, <laughs> to two or three days to, to finalize it. I know exactly what is necessary to get it out of staging, just the, the final finishing touches. Uh, yes, can, can you use the reference implementation as sniffer modes? Yes, you can. Uh, CEC C, uh, CTL has a minus M mode that enables the monitoring. So there are... It make it work on Raspberry Pi, but I don't know. Well, Raspberry Pi, there is no C, at least I haven't seen a CC driver using for this yet from the Raspberry Pi. So they have CEC, but it is a custom. Like everybody else today, they have a custom implementation. You look at Android, Interestingly enough, interestingly enough, most SOCs, they have CEC support, but they all have their own proprietary shitty driver. And they have nothing like a framework like this that shields you from a lot of the complexities. It is just very low level transmit and receive and the rest, figure it out yourself. Good luck. And also, uh, is there any real product test from official HDMI compliance test using this framework or do you have any plan? Um, this does not replace, so is there any, if, it comes on, and if I understand the question correctly, is there any product that uses this that passes the compliance test? Yes, because there are some... Well, uh, no, because this is brand new. So there has been no time for anybody to use it. Um, hopefully we will, because we are using it in our products, so hopefully we will, we will pass. But it's, it's just too soon at this moment. Um, Given the fact that pretty much all of the implementations I have seen and tested, they all fail even this compliance test, I, uh, sus I, I would be really surprised if there is anyone that has proper com full compliance with CEC. It's, it's horrible, frankly. I, I don't know. I mean, they, they fail on very basic stuff. It's not even some, some obscure corner case. No, as I said, just you send a message that is not supported and they just time out instead of sending me a feature report. And that is sort of CEC 101. Uh, I, I don't understand. Uh, this is with, say, almost several prominent TV vendors that we tried. I, I have yet to see a product that is really... Well, we had one, I think a DVD player or a Blu-ray player. It was fairly decent. But certainly the TVs that we tested, it was, uh, let's say, disappointing. Maybe that's where the naming comes from. Not naming it CDC, you can not <coughs> adhere to the specification. Well, if you, impl uh, if you implement CEC, then you need to adhere to the specification. Yeah, but you can't but any link or something like that. Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, who knows why? I, 
perhaps they do it for that reason that they sort of call it any link, any net, because hey, we don't really do CEC. Yeah, so what's the So what what is the plan with specific vendors? Um, so the f the framework. So there is a libcc out there that is currently that is implementing a user space stack as well for CEC, but it's using the proprietary to custom APIs that exist today because there was no standard API. I'm hoping someone, it won't be me, but someone will actually add support for this as well. That library has a whole bunch of support for quirks. Uh, perhaps some of those could be put into the kernel, but I really, that is more a user space thing. The kernel should do the core stuff. What I'm hoping is that when people use this framework and use these compliance tests and use the, the reference code, that they will actually produce something that is much closer to what the standard specifies because so much is handled by the framework, hopefully correctly. Uh, so it's a chicken and egg. There was no framework, there were no compliance tests, well, not unless you bought very expensive equipment. So I'm trying to resolve that by giving a good alternative, by giving some compliance tests, by giving some utilities and tools and code so people can do a better job of this. Uh, time will tell. I, I got one new driver already for 4.9, so uh, there seems to be a lot of interest in getting this to work. Uh, I'm hoping to see more drivers. If you, have, if you want to do that, you want to add support, just contact me. Uh, there is one thing. So DRM, when you, when you, what you really want is that when you register your CEC device, you will also get the EDID from the DRM driver. Uh, Russell King made a framework for that. It is not merged, it is missing a feature. I hope to find some time to look at it as well, because that would be really nice. Uh, to, it would make it a lot easier to write CEC drivers for those specific devices. Uh, how are we with time? I think it's out of time, actually. Thank you.